Hey band, great job. Great job, you guys. Yeah. Uh, today, uh, go ahead and grab a seat. Um, I'm so excited about this. Uh, who's been with us for part of the Seven Deadly Sins series? Seven Deadly Sins. Uh, I'm telling you, my hope is that you have been both encouraged and challenged. Anybody been encouraged to do better? Anybody? Have you been challenged to do better, though? Because you got to have both. you got to have some encouragement and some challenge in life. Amen? And uh, God wants to make us better in every area of life. And there are these seven deadly sins that seem to hold on to us. We've been talking about those for seven weeks now. This is week number seven. And um, I hope that your heart is open. And I hope that your heart is willing to hear um, the voice of God, not the voice of a preacher. You don't need a voice of a preacher. You need the voice of God in your life. I do. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen? Yeah. And so uh, today is going to be very special because, uh, you know, one of the things that we do as a church on purpose is we want to give our faith to the next generation. Amen? Uh, we want to purposely raise up younger leaders. Um, I'm getting old, people. We need to make sure we have somebody in the wings. Come on. That was a joke. You guys should say, like, no, you're not old, Pastor Jay. You're still kicking it. Come on, people. you got to help me out a little bit. I know you're getting hot out there. But uh, it, this is a great day because uh, one of the things that we want to do around here is we want to invest in some younger communicators, uh, young men and women who feel like they have a voice that they want to let out, that they, that they want the world to hear about. And uh, th there's a message that God has put on their hearts. And uh, one of the young communicators in our church, younger communicators, is a guy named Justin Peters. Uh, he is a dear friend of mine. I've known him for a lot of years. And God has used him in all kinds of areas in the life of our church. He currently leads uh, in, in both our Generation City and our 1825 ministries. Uh, he's launching a brand new ministry called Single Life uh, for those who are 26 to 39 and single. So if that's you, it's coming up in June. It's going to be great. And uh, Justin is, uh, is a man of God. He, he's a man of God. He loves God with all of his heart. And uh, he's a growing communicator. So would you guys show him a lot of grace and welcome uh, as he comes to lead us today? All right, good. Hey, turn these uh, front monitors down a little bit, if you know how. There you go. Come on. Thank you. Oh, <clears throat> my goodness. Um, let's go. My heart is beating strong for this message today, and uh, I hope you guys are prepared for what God has for you. I promise I won't be long. I know you guys are hot. Like, I'm hot standing out here singing with you. So I promise I will do my best to get through this message, but I believe that this is a message for Metro City Church and for myself included. And so this is my church. I love you guys. I have grown up with you guys. You guys mean the world to me. And so thank you for giving me the opportunity to hang out with you guys and talk to you about God's work. Okay, and so, by the way, I know Pastor Jeremy talked about the 1825 Backyard Barbecue next week after church. I don't know if he mentioned, but there will be free lunch. I think that's important, so I just want to throw that out there so you guys uh, will consider coming. And so, thank you again for uh, having me, and I am excited. Are you guys excited? I know. It's hot, though. But we're going to get through this, okay? We're going to go to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 20. So if you have your Bible, um, you can go to Matthew 20. So you're kind of like there when we go there. But uh, as he said, as Pastor Jay said, we have been in this series called Seven Deadly Sins. And we have been talking about different things like lust and greed and pride and anger and sloth, which is laziness. We're going to talk about envy today. Today is the seventh deadly sin. And now we understand, I understand, that sin is sin. But there's something that, there's something that uh, is about these, there's, there seems to be something about these seven deadly sins uh, that are specifically crushing humanity since the very beginning. They seem to plague mankind from the very beginning, and guess what? It's 2021, 
and it's no different today. And so, yes, we're in a series called Seven Deadly Sins because we believe that it's worth talking about. Yes, we're going to talk about Jesus. Yes, we're going to talk about uh, the salvation that G only Jesus can offer and the hope that he brings. But we want to be educated from Scripture what these seven deadly sins are doing to humanity. And so today, we're going to talk about envy, okay? And so I want to give you a definition really quick about envy specifically. And then uh, I'm going to quote a great philosopher. You'll probably know him. But the definition of envy that I have is it's an emotion which occurs when a person lacks another superior quality, achievement, or possession and either desires it or, this is, this is good, this is big right here, wishes that the other lacked it, okay? The great philosopher Aristotle says, he defines envy like this, pain at the sight of another's good fortune stirred by those who have what we ought to have. That's Aristotle, the great philosopher. Now, we can trace envy all the way back to the very beginning. If you're not familiar with the Genesis account, God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke light into existence. He created birds. He created animals. He created the trees. He created the bugs. I don't know why, but he did. And he created man, and he saw that it was good. He saw that it was good, but he realized that man was alone, so he created woman. He caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep, the scripture says, and, and fashioned and formed woman from, from Adam. And then the story goes on to basically tell us that they had everything. They, they could do everything or anything they wanted except for one single thing. And it wouldn't be long before envy would slip into creation. Can you believe this? The garden of perfection, the garden of paradise, wasn't enough for humanity. It wasn't enough for man Kind. They wanted what they didn't have. They wanted the one thing that they weren't allowed to have, and they became blind to what they already had. And this is what envy will do. It will blind you of what God has already given you, and you'll only see what you don't have. That's good, right? That's good. Now listen, fast forward a couple thousand years into the New Testament. We're going to go to the we're going to go to the Gospel of Matthew and we're going to see that envy or this thing called jealousy is still plaguing humanity. And I'm going to take you to a parable uh, that Jesus is teaching. It's a story that has spiritual meaning. It has spiritual weight, but it's something that we would understand here on earth. And Jesus is the best at this. He tells these parables to try to help people understand how his kingdom operates. Okay. And so I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 20. My notes are going to blow around. I'm trying to make this uh, look professional up here. But I want to share with you in, uh, from Matthew, tw Matthew 20, three observations, okay? And I want to talk about how, uh, how envy, how envy uh, reveals itself. And I want to talk to you how it reveals itself through, through comparison. And then I'm going to talk to you about who envy rent, uh, resents. So, number one, how envy presents itself. Secondly, who it resents. And then lastly, here it is, and where it relents. And so that means, other, in other words, like where it stops or where it ends. I know this is going to be good because all three of them, re, uh, all three of them rhyme, right? Presents, uh, resents, 
and relent. I used to be a rapper. It's not a big deal, okay? It is what it is. But no, I do, I do have to give credit to this man named J.D. Rogers. He's from The Porch, which is like a young adult ministry in Dallas, Texas. And they, they were teaching on this series called The Seven Deadly Sins as well. So I just want to give credit to his three observations. Presents, resents, and relents, okay? We're talking about envy, okay? So go with me to Matthew chapter 20, and we're gonna read, we're gonna read uh, 15 verses, okay? So if you haven't read your Bible all week long, which I hope that's not true, uh, we're gonna read 15 verses right now, and I promise I'll be quick. I know it's hot, I'm sweating already, okay? But we're gonna get through this. Matthew chapter 20, remember, remember this is a parable about Jesus' kingdom and how he operates, how the king operates in his domain, okay? So it's a kingdom parable, it says this, for the kingdom of heaven, this is Jesus talking, he's teaching, is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. What? And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too. And whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, of course, going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, which was late in the day, probably around four o'clock, the end of the workday. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all stinking day? It don't say stinking, but it says all day. They said to him, because no one has hired us. Making excuses, right? He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, and then sweat is like dripping in my eyes. It's like literally hard to read this. Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. What? Somebody say, what? Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. Of course, of course they would. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Wow, that relates. <laughs> but he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. Last couple of verses. I choose to give. I choose to give. That's good right there. That could be the message, a title message, a message, title of the message. As I give to you, as I give to you, and I am not allowed, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Wow. So the last will be first, and the last, or the first, last. I want to title this message, though, Celebration and Gratitude. Celebration and Gratitude. We're talking about the seven deadly sins. We're talking about envy. We're talking about jealousy. And I want to title this talk, or this message, Seven I mean, excuse me, celebration and gratitude. So would you pray with me, Jesus? Thank you so much for these minutes and moments that we have together outside. Help us to be a family. Help us to celebrate one another today. Help us to be the church. Help us to have fun. I pray that you help us to get through uh, these next few moments together and that we actually lock into what you have to say to Metro City Church. We love you and we thank you and we ask that this summer it does not get hotter than this today. In Jesus' name, everybody says, amen. So I have a quick question for you. I want to know, by a show of hands, who thinks life isn't fair? Would you, would you agree that life isn't fair? That's good. That's some of you. Well, I just want to tell you that you're right. Life isn't fair. It's not. Just look around you. Everybody's different, right? We all, have, we all have different fingerprints for crying out loud. We all, we have different hair. We have 
we have different family, we have different circumstances. Life is not fair. For example, there's winning and there's losing. I'm just trying to break it to you guys. I'm trying to give it to you straight today. There's winning and there's losing. I know there's some soccer moms and some soccer dads. Where's my, where's my soccer dads at? Make some noise. Okay, we got some soccer dads in the house. Listen, I just want to say that I know that some of you probably signed up your baby, your, your cute son or cute daughter for soccer this year, and you signed them up for a league that does not keep score. I think that's cute. But for me, I understand that there is winning and losing, okay? I keep score. My daughter, Mia, for the first time, uh, she played soccer this year. Very first season. It was a big deal, right? We had our first game in Northville. We got ready, got up early in the morning, drove out to Northville on a Saturday where all the big houses are at. I was like, wow, this is inspiring, right? We're going to a soccer game, and it, this is a big deal, right? And we get there, long story short, they tied. They tied two to two. And I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm like keeping score the whole time, asking parents like, hey, what's the score? They're looking at me kind of like, it's not that serious, bro. And I asked the coach, what's the score, coach? Because then they know that you're invested, you know. They know you're involved. And they, you make a connection. But when I found out they tied at the end 2-2, I was devastated. I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is not God's will. They need to have a shootout or something, you know what I mean? Like, come on, kids. You can't tie. Tying's gross. It's like kissing your sister, you know what I mean? It's ridiculous. So going on, I basically just want to kind of uh, convince you that life is not fair and there is such thing as winning and losing. If you can't relate to that, these notes are difficult. If you can't relate to that, maybe some of you men will relate to me about this or with this. Tom Brady's still winning Super Bowls at 43 years old, okay? So I'm telling you, life is not fair. Why can't Detroit just win one Super Bowl? It's not fair. There's winning and there's losing. Now let's take it a step further. Don't shoot me, but I want to say this. God's not fair. God is just. God is faithful. And God is good. And God is many other things. But not once in Scripture does God declare that I'm fair. Life is not fair. And God is fair. If I could be honest, I look at my, my mom and dad, and I wonder why my mom and dad can't be like my wife's mom and dad. I think about things like that. I see young people in the church, oh, I'm getting pumped up right now, getting married at 20. Oh, sorry for yelling. I don't mean to yell. But I had to wait till I'm 36. I think it was 35. I'm 37 now, okay? Life's not fair. You know, I think about things like for me, I look at other preachers and pastors and I wonder why can't I be that good? I see them speaking at conferences, I see them writing books, and I see them having, I see, they have so many friends it seems like. I'm like, why can't people love me like they love them? Life isn't fair it seems like. I think about Zachary. I'm like, why can't I have hair like Zachary? Where you at, bro? <laughs> you know? But seriously, I, I know in my heart that life is not fair. And it seems to me that God isn't fair. And I know that there's some things in your heart floating around that are causing you even today while you sit in your chair and say to yourself, life isn't fair. God isn't fair. And guess what? That is envy when we begin to want what other people have and we become blind to what God has already given us. God has given us so much, but we become blind to what he has given us, to what he has gave us. And that will destroy you. I'm going to give you a couple quick examples. You think about Joseph. 
the dreamer with the Gucci coat, okay? He was in the Old Testament. He was a dreamer. He was a man of God. He was favored by his father out of 12 sons, and he had dreams to do great things. And by the way, he had this really cool colored coat. I call it a Gucci coat because I don't really know the brand of it, but that's what I'm calling it. And guess what? His brothers, his brothers literally went, went to kill him but they ended up instead, they dropped him in a pit and then sold him into slavery at the right moment. And literally, Joseph, if you read Joseph's story, he goes on to go through many different things and God works it out, it's incredible. But envy literally caused these 12 brothers, these, these big, this big family to kill their little brother Joseph. And then if you, if you go on to the story of King David, King David was a great man of God but yet, yet the Saul, the, the current king Saul, literally tried to kill David. It says that the scripture says that God gave Saul his thousands, but it gave David his tens of thousands. And it caused envy inside of Saul's heart. And it caused Saul wanting to, to try to kill King David. And then even fast forward into the, into the New Testament, James and John. These two closest followers of Jesus followed Jesus for three and a half years of their life and they were still arguing over the most honorable, honorable position in heaven in eternity, James and John. If anything, let that be encouraging to you today. These two literally, physically, tangibly walked with Jesus for three and a half years and they were still struggling over jealousy and so, those are just three quick examples that I wanna share with you to try to help you understand that humanity has been being plagued with this thing called envy for generation after generation. If you look at our passage, okay, we're shifting gears now. Track with me. If you look at our passage today, it screams unfair. Our passage that we read today in Matthew 20 screams unfair. This owner of this vineyard hires five different groups of people. Remember, he hires the first group of people, which would have been around 6 a.m. Going on, he hires a couple more groups of people throughout the day, a couple groups of workers. And then finally, it says that he, he hires the 11th hour group of people, which would be at the end of the day. And then the vineyard owner, it says that the vineyard or, or, uh, owner hired or told the foreman to line them all up at the end of the day and pay them in a way that was no doubt frustrating. Because you can imagine that this foreman was probably thinking, I'm going to be the most hated foreman in Down River. Okay, I'm going to be the most hated foreman in this area. He, he's, he's told to line them up from the, from the last to the first. And he says, pay the last uh, first and the, and the first last. And so <clears throat> you have to imagine that these, these workers were, were no doubt frustrated. It's hot. It's been hot all day. They want to go home. They want their denarius and they're ready to go home. But no, <clears throat> the foreman or the owner says, line them up. And here they are standing. Here's the last group of, the last group of worker, the worker gets, um, gets a denarius for like maybe one hour of work. Could you imagine? They probably got there, got their tools ready by the time they actually started working. There might have been 30 minutes left. And so they got an hour, they have the denarius, which was a day's wage, by the way. So they got their denarius, and the next thing you know, you, you can imagine the people like that got there at 6 a.m. were probably like looking down the line. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh shoot, he got a Daenerys. We're about to get four at least. We're going to Black Rock tonight, okay? Or Texas State, Brazil, whatever. And uh, they're watching, they're watching, they're watching. And the next thing you know, it says that they got a Daenerys for their days, for their day's wage or for their work as well. And it says, upon receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house. And it says, he replied to one of them, did you not agree with me for a denarius? I did no wrong. Why do you begrudge me? Or why do you begrudge my generosity? That's crazy. So they made a deal with God, but now they were, all of a sudden, they weren't happy with what they, they made a deal for because they compared to what the 11th hour people got and the 9th hour people got or the group of workers. And I just want to say this, 
that we do the same thing in the church. The vineyard, you could say, is a, is a picture of the church, and the vineyard owner is, is, is God. Literally, we people, some of us, maybe not all of you, of course, but some of us come to a place like this, and we've been around for 10 years, and we see somebody else come in the door, they've only been here for, for a month, and it seems like God's recognizing them. And we think to ourselves, well, what about us? What about me? I've been here for 10 years and I don't get fill in the blank, right? Fill in the blank. And we literally say things like, well, guess what? If they're not gonna notice me, if they don't recognize me, you know what I'll do? I'll just go down to the church around the corner because they'll notice me. So that's what I'm gonna do. Yeah, and we do the same thing because we start to compare to what God is doing in other people's lives and we think that he has forgotten us. Sometimes I think that the, 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 the issue with God forgetting us is not as bad as when we see God remembering somebody else. And we start to wrestle with this thing called envy. It's real. Listen, envy, envy presents itself through comparison. That's the number one point. Envy presents itself through comparison. Understand that comparison kills contentment. The first group of workers were content. Were content. They were. They made an agreement. They were like, cool, that's what's up. And until they saw the last group of workers get a denarius as well. And when they seen that, they began to compare and envy set in and it killed their contentment. I'm gonna just give you a quick illustration. Oh dear, oh dear. I'm gonna give you a quick illustration and uh, I think this will, this will kinda help, help you see what, I, what I'm trying to uh, explain, okay? And so there's three cups up here and thank you. There's three cups up here and I'm gonna ask, I'm not gonna ask that you come up here and choose one, but we're just gonna picture that I kinda called on three people, okay? I call on the first person, and you're like, oh, this is great, this is exciting, <laughs> I got chose, you know, they called me. And you come up, and I'm like, hey, listen, all you gotta do is pick whatever, like whatever's in the cup, you get, it's yours. There's no skill, there's no skill, all you gotta do is pick a cup, and whatever's in it, you get it. And you're like, cool, and you come up, and you say you just picked this one. You picked the one on the side. And you're like, oh, shoot. You're like, a $100 bill. You're like, let's go. And everybody cheers, right? And you're like, lunch is on me, right? Probably not. And uh, you're happy. You know, you're like, this is a good day. I can't believe I just like won $100. And then you go and sit down. Track with me. Track with me. I know it's hot. I know it's hot. My paper's blue everywhere too. It's not good. Um, and then the second person gets called up. Okay, the second person gets called up and you're like, oh shoot, like I don't, I don't know if I should pick this one or this one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick this one, you know, cause it's like opposite of this one. And you pick it and you're like, oh, what's this? And you start looking and you're like, two free round trip tickets to Hawaii? What? And you see the crowd erupts and everybody's like, oh my goodness. And you're like, this is the best day ever. And then the person next, the person that got the $100 bill, now all of a sudden they're like, well, shoot, why didn't I, why didn't I, I should have picked the other cup. I'm not so happy with my $100 at this point no more. And see, envy begins to set in when we look and we start to compare with what other people have. And now the last person comes up and they literally get, uh, they open up the lid and they're excited because they're like, wow, Metro's got it like that. T tickets to Hawaii, $100. What else is gonna be in there? And they get, they open it up and they're like, oh, what's this? And they grab out some Starburst some Starburst people, and listen, yeah, Pastor Jay's like, glory to God. Listen, not the orange and yellow ones, though. This is the orange and yellow Starburst. They're not even real. They're not even real Starburst. And so now the person with the $100 bill is like, well, okay then, I guess my $100 is not that bad after all. 
and you start to compare and you start to literally uh, uh, become jealous of what other people have or what they don't have and you compare and you compare and you compare. And I, I have the second point, but I don't want to, I, I just want to make sure that I'm on track here. My notes are going everywhere. Please do not freak out, Pastor Jay. This is, this is a tough situation here, okay? I think I got it though, okay? So that is the first observation. Uh, envy presents itself through comparison. Secondly, I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to go for it, guys. Secondly, envy resents our creator. It presents itself through comparison, and we begin to make people out to be the problem when in reality we're actually resenting our creator. Envy resents our creator, which is, which is difficult to swallow, but it's very, very true. I want to take you to the verses 13 through 15 in our passage. It says this, but he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? Just like the owner of the vineyard, like I said, by the way, that's God, chooses to do with what he wants, with who he wants, he does the same in life as well. He wants us to understand that he's going to do what he wants with who he wants, and we are not to begrudge his genera uh, generosity. When you look around and you see a family that you dream of having, it's not it's not, the, it's not their fault. We're actually resenting God when envy sets in because that's God's doing. God gave them that family. When you look around at, uh, and you see somebody in the position that you want, maybe the job that you wanted, guess what? That's God's doing. And we begin to make people out to be the problem. Even when you look at people that are super talented and, you, and they're doing what you dream of doing and they're like freaks of nature, guess what? That's God's doing as well. And when we begin to resent them, we're actually getting it super mixed up because we're resenting our creator. He is the owner of the vineyard. He's the owner. And so... It, when we, when we, excuse me, when, 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 when we resent people, we're actually resenting God because he is the one who gives us what he wants to and to who he wants to. And so the one thing that we can actually do to help with that is, is celebrate, is celebrate. And that's the third observation is envy relents or it ends or stops with celebration. And understand, you can't celebrate other people if you're not grateful for, grateful for what you have. And so envy, envy ends or it stops with celebration. And I know this can be difficult because when we go on social, me social media, we see somebody, maybe a friend, or a family member even, uh, maybe, maybe we see God meeting with them in a special way. We see, we see people actually getting the house that they wanted. We see, we see our friend going on the date that we wanted to go on. There's different ways that envy, envy literally li tries to fill our heart with jealousy. It, it is jealousy. Jealousy fills our heart, and the only solution is to celebrate the people that are literally in front of us and around us and on social media. Maybe we need to pray before we go on to social media and ask God to prepare our hearts for what we're about to see. 
Because I don't know about you, but for me, when I go, I'll be literally just sitting at home. I don't even realize it. I just go on Instagram or I go on Facebook. And now, now all of a sudden, I'm seeing my friends doing things that I wanted to do, going on vacations that I want to go on. And I'm not prepared for that. And if we were, maybe we could actually love that post. Now, I'm not talking about liking it. I'm talking about loving that post and actually saying something like, I don't know, congratulations on that post because we can celebrate them because we're grateful for what we have. I know Paul says in, in the book of Philippians that I have learned to become content with whatever, with, with, with whether or not I have little or I have a lot, or if I have everything. It says, look, look, I have it right here. No, or not that I was ever in need, he says. Not that I was ever in need. See, what we want is what causes envy. When we look around and we see other people doing things that we want, they have things that we want. It's not about what we need because we have what we need. We have everything that we need. I think that we... We have forgotten what God has done for us. It says that he has, held, he has withheld nothing good from us. The scripture says uh, in Psalms 84, he's, he's, he's given us every good thing that we need. He has given us, by the way, uh, he has given us his son. His son, he has sent, for, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his son, what more do we actually need? We have everything that we need in Jesus. Literally, Jesus is the very reason why we don't need to be envious. He's already given us everything that we could ever ask for. Even if he never gave us another single thing in our life, he's already given us enough through his son, Jesus. And because of that, we can be grateful and we can celebrate the people that are in our lives and they can destroy and crush this thing, envy, in our heart. Otherwise, it will crush us. Envy will crush us if we do not learn how to celebrate other people and be grateful for what we have. We're going to be living in constant comparison, thinking, what about me? How come life isn't fair? And I just want to end by saying, you're right. Life isn't fair. And God's not fair neither. He gives what he wants to who he wants. And we ought not to begrudge his generosity and trust that he is good. Trust that he is faithful. And he has plans for us. His no in your life is maybe just not yet. And so trust the process. Be thankful what, for thankful for what you have. I know in First Thessalonians it says, um, "Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus." If we can have thankful hearts and be grateful for what we have, we can begin to celebrate other people in our life and crush this thing called envy. And so that's it. That's all I have. My notes are everywhere. I'm so sorry. Ah, that's why I had these water bottles and stuff. But I want to pray, and then the band's going to come back up here, I believe. Nope, they're not, they're not even going to come back up here. That's okay. I'll be up here by myself. That's okay. Uh, let me pray, and uh, let's have some fun after this, after this. So, Jesus, thank you so much for this church and for this day. Thank you for our families. Thank you for your word. Thank you for our friends. Thank you so much for the weather. I know it's hot, but it does feel good, kind of, God. And we thank you for that. I thank you for this opportunity, God. Help us to live thankful. Help us to be full of gratitude so we can celebrate our friends and our family. We want to crush this thing, jealousy, this thing called envy in our lives and in our hearts because we understand, God, if we don't, it will crush us. We love you and we thank you for your son and for everything that you're going to do in our lives, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I think, yep.